Attention all bases, attention all bases. This is Iron Hand, this is Iron Hand. This is a shock alert. I repeat, this is a shock alert. For 40 years, America's Strategic Air Command was the backbone of the West's defense against the Soviet bloc. A war machine of unimaginable destructive power, SAC was presented as the greatest deterrent to war. Deterrence, that's a word that's become familiar to most of us. In the Air Force, deterrence is almost synonymous with SAC, the Strategic Air Command. In locations around the globe, SAC aircraft and missiles remain ready day and night to strike back instantaneously at any would-be aggressor. And yet, all of SAC's strength has little meaning unless there is command and control that is exact, flexible, far-reaching, and dependable. That command and control of the world's most powerful force rested in the hands of Second World War hero, General Curtis E. LeMay. It was only when LeMay stood for vice president that he jokingly revealed he thought the world took the danger of nuclear weapons too seriously. We exploded over 20 weapons out of Bikini, our testing ground, our first testing ground. And the fish are all back in the lagoons. Coconut trees are growing coconuts. The wobble bushes have fruit on them. Everything is about the same except the rats. The rats are supposed to be vaporized inside this fireball, but uh, the rats out there are bigger, fatter, and healthier than they ever were before. So, taking a hasty look at these facts, you might come to the conclusion to put 20-some bombs down in one place and you improve it. Zach won the Cold War. A lot of people don't realize this but SAC won the Cold War. The Russians knew that if they made a move, that we had the power to destroy them. The May's job gave him the authority to retaliate against Soviet attack. What nobody knew was that from his command post buried deep underground at Omaha, the May tried to provoke the Kremlin. The blueprint for baiting the bear and for victory in the Cold War is revealed in the 1950s top secret plan called Project Control. Project Control uh, was a plan for attempting to coerce the Soviet Union by overflights of US planes over the Soviet territory in the Soviet uh, bloc. Shriver, who was in charge of development of new weapons, asked LeMay, what is your requirement for a bomb for the Soviet Union? Meaning, uh, how large a bomb do you want us to develop? Uh, one megaton, ten megatons, uh, larger even? And LeMay said, one bomb for Russia. That was his, his requirement. That, that's what, that was the aspiration. And that's what he designed, in effect an air force that, um, that acted as closely as possible to one plane or one bomb. Autumn 1944. The final stage of the Pacific War was beginning. The American commanders had seen the ferocious Japanese defense of Iwo Jima. They believed that an invasion of Japan would cost hundreds of thousands of Allied lives. Instead, they would bomb Japan to defeat. Using the new B-29 bomber, the Americans attacked strategic installations. But because of the weather and high altitude winds, few planes reached their targets. On one occasion, 200 bombers failed to destroy a single factory. The final straw was a raid on Tokyo in which the majority of bombs landed in the harbor. The Japanese joked that the Americans were trying to drown them. In early 1945, Curtis E. LeMay, the youngest major general ever appointed to the Air Force, was sent out to invigorate the bombing campaign. LeMay was a proven organizer and innovator. Within weeks of his arrival, he changed the whole direction of the air war. LeMay had witnessed Bomber Harris's campaign. 
he turned his planes from industrial and strategic centers to whole cities. Now Japanese civilians were to be sacrificed rather than LeMay's own American crews. He started with a night raid on Tokyo on March the 10th, 1945. が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が空気が
America settled down to enjoy the dividends of peace. But LeMay had his doubts that peace would last. America cannot afford to await the next war, he said. It will come without warning, and everything will depend on her readiness to fight. The next war will be fought out fast. It'll be a war of rockets, radar, television-guided missiles, and atomic power. Before the next war, the Air Force must be allowed to develop unhindered, unchained. There must be no ceilings, no boundaries, no limitations to our air development. Looking toward Europe from Moscow, Soviet Russia was expensively stabbing westward, knifing into nations left empty by war, with misery and chaos and By 1948, much of Eastern Europe had been taken over by communists. In May, Stalin cut the land and rail routes into the isolated city of Berlin. LeMay was the man chosen to prevent the strangulation of the city. He was to organize a mighty airlift to feed and supply Berlin. General LeMay used to go out and fly the airplane in himself every once in a while to be sure everything was working. If it wasn't, he'd come back, he'd call his staff together and say, look, it took me half an hour to turn around in Berlin. I had to go in and I had to sign uh, uh, my flight plan and everything. I don't want that to happen. Next time I go in, I want to go in and unload. I want uh, somebody to come up and hand me a flight plan that's already signed and I don't even get out of the airplane. I'll just turn around and take it back and uh, we'll uh, let the next plane get in and uh, do the same thing. LeMay believed that the success of the airlift had shown how air power alone could inhibit Soviet aggression. The Berlin crisis had also demonstrated how, as he had feared, the American military could still be caught on the hop. LeMay returned to America to take over the newly formed Strategic Air Command, the only offensive nuclear force in the world. His task? To prevent another Pearl Harbor. At SAC headquarters in Omaha, LeMay found the command in a sorry state. Not one plane or crew was capable of fulfilling a mission. He called together his team from the Pacific War, bringing his old aide, Tommy Power, into SAC as Deputy Commander-in-Chief. He set about cultivating an esprit de corps unique to SAC. ...areas and other targets in the shortest possible time. To us, the only difference between peace and war is where we place our bombs. LeMay decided to test SAC's crews by staging a mock bombing raid against the city of Dayton, Ohio, under realistic wartime conditions. Four, six, five, three cars will tower. Roger, clear to roll. Roger, 653, rolling. Here we go. Well, the Dayton bombing exercise was, uh, was a revelation of how, how uh, unprofessional we were. Uh, we felt that we could fly formation. We felt we could take off a heavy airplane. We could go through thunderstorms and fly a long time and get back. As far as bombing is concerned, we had bombs dropping anywhere from 35 miles to... Uh, a lot of them that never reached the, even the general area. It was a debacle, but it was a revelation. And it's, it started a, a, a great deal of training to, to not let that happen again. Day after day, SAC ran practice bombing raids on every major U.S. city. San Francisco was bombed 600 times in one month. With this training program, LeMay created a highly skilled, loyal elite. Across the, uh, well, he was a real man, and he was a real commander. He knew how to get 100% productivity out of his forces. He understood how to uh, train them so they would be disciplined to the extent that uh, they could be sent on one of these missions that was so hazardous. And at the beginning, our missions were very hazardous. My first uh, mission 
I could make target and fly 50 miles, and I had to bail out. I didn't have enough fuel to go any further, and uh, but I was willing to do that. Of course, I did study Russian, and I became a black belt judo guy to enhance my survival, but... You know, it takes a lot of uh, instilling dedication in you to do that, and LeMay was capable of doing that. ...conditions that simulate as closely as possible actual war. When Russia exploded its first atomic bomb in August 1949, LeMay decided to take matters into his own hands. At that time, America's nuclear weapons were kept under civilian control. Now, LeMay went behind the scenes to secure direct access to the bombs if, in a crisis, he and the president were out of contact. In the late 1940s, General LeMay made a private arrangement with the general in New Mexico who was in charge of the nuclear stockpile, which was all stored there on a base near Los Alamos where the weapons were being assembled. That if Washington was out of reach somehow, uh, he would take command of the weapons and pick them up and load them on planes and fly away. In a sense, then, he was arranging an independent control over the nuclear stockpile, independent from the president, who was the one who constitutionally had that responsibility. The May's point was the war would be over the second day. Therefore, you had to be prepared as if you were already at war. All that material that was going to be built after the war began had to be built before the war began. And that, of course, feeds directly into a war mentality. It says we're already at war, and LeMay used to say to his people, we're already at war. LeMay's war mentality led him to argue for the unlimited expansion of SAC. He went to Congress to claim a bomber gap was developing, that SAC was being outstripped by the Soviets. I have already brought out that the Soviets will have a numerical advantage in long-range bombers during the time period. By taking the most extreme estimates of Soviet bomber production, LeMay painted a grim picture of the Soviets forging ahead. Then we will be inferior in striking power to the Soviet long-range air force by 1958-1960. Do you fear this mass invention that they call atomic power? Are we all in great confusion? Do we know the time or LeMay was given the weapons to destroy the whole communist bloc in one strike. Leaving horrible destruction, blotting out the works of man. Sack bases were the front line of the Cold War. Crews that were on 15-minute alert, their airplane was loaded with atomic munitions. They were parked in a chevron strip up near the active end of the runway. They could leave to go to the club and have something to eat, but they were in flying suits, and they still had to get their airplane off of the ground within 15 minutes. Though official U.S. policy was to contain the Soviet threat, the May was convinced that SAC would win a war with Russia with few American casualties. The view was that you had to have a set plan that could not be altered because this was going to be such a whiz-bang rapid-fire war that you weren't going to be able to sit down and figure out what your next move was going to be. It really, in this view, had to be pre-programmed. It was get as many weapons off the ground as rapidly as possible and deliver them as sort of Federal Express as rapidly as possible on the target. Highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack... When Stalin's ally regime in North Korea launched an invasion into South Korea, this was seen by much of the military as the first step in the Kremlin's plan to attack the United States itself. ...no quarter was given by a foe equipped with the latest Russian armament. In Washington, although Truman's policy remained the containment of communism, some senior military officials began to ask whether America should strike the Soviet Union first, an idea that was dubbed preventive war. It was clearly very controversial, and it was hard to say 
I'm in favor of preventive war, or I think this might be a good idea. So it tended to sort of be back-channel conversation or conversations off the record. It was taking place, and it partly formed the atmosphere of Washington in the late 1940s and early 1950s. But it, it's hard to say, because no one really wanted to go on record, saying that they were in favor of it or that they were even talking about it in serious tones. And yet, we know, and it, as, as a historian of this period, I can see that it was being discussed, it was, it was being toyed with, in the salons of Washington. When General Anderson, head of the Air War College, publicly advocated a first strike, he was fired the next day. Shortly thereafter, an Air War College team led by Colonel Raymond Sleeper developed a top secret plan that included threatening preventive war. Professor Biddle studied the now declassified papers. I was reading the documents. It seemed quite unbelievable to me. I mean, I thought I was thinking to myself, Stanley Kubrick was right. <laughs> Dr. Strangelove's exist. The plan was inspired by British colonial tactics of the 1920s, when the RAF intimidated local tribes by dominating their territory and attacking them from the air. The American plan, called Project Control, was to treat the Soviets as unruly natives. Using superior air power and the threat of nuclear weapons, America would force the communist bloc to dismantle itself or risk nuclear attack. Project Control is uh, based on the premise or the assumption that if the Soviets were clearly shown that we had the capability to overfly, their whole territory, and therefore by implications to drop bombs if we wanted to, uh, that they would essentially capitulate. Project Control required that they free the satellites, give up the, the communist efforts to expand, break up the alliance between the Soviet Union and China. In other words, totally um, abandon the, all, all the various elements of their basic policy. The Air Force began to promote the ideas of Project Control in Washington. They offered an end to the Cold War, one way or another. They were very concerned about this feeling of being in, in a state of limbo, of being in an unresolved state of Cold War, which is very unnatural in a way, particularly for military men who know war and they know peace. This in-between phase was very unsettling. And how long will this last? And how long will it go on? And can you always maintain the initiative? Utilizing overflight to get what you want and even being willing to go to a stage of preventive war was a way of settling the issue. The most innovative and confrontational part of Project Control was the use of spy overflights. Overflights would have two possible benefits. One was a manifestation of both the capability and the determination of the United States. It would also provide very substantial intelligence with respect to target systems if, in fact, the second stage of, of uh, project control ever were put into effect, namely the attempt to strike out, to knock out the Soviet nuclear capabilities uh, if they did not capitulate to the overflight. Although Project Control was still on the drawing board and had not been seen by the politicians, LeMay decided effectively to test run its central idea. On the 8th of May 1954, he ordered a secret spy flight over the Soviet Union. He did not seek President Eisenhower's permission. Colonel Hal Austin and his crew flew north round Norway to the Soviet port of Murmansk. There they suddenly dashed south, deep into the Kola Peninsula, photographing Soviet airfields and dodging MiG fighters. General May uh, congratulate us for... Uh for a great mission. He said, I tried to get you guys a silver star, but he said, uh, you got to explain that to Congress and everybody else in Washington when you do something like that, so here's a couple of DFCs we'll give you for that mission. Project Control was widely briefed around Washington. 
It was enthusiastically received by the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. But when it reached the State Department, it met with opposition from Robert Bowie and his boss, John Foster Dulles. The issue came to a head in the end of 1954, when Dulles himself finally said in the NSC, what do you really want us to do? Do you want us to try to give a ultimatum that uh, if they don't give up uh, the satellite areas that uh, they will, we will strike them? Or what is it that you're trying to get us to do? If you're talking about something like that, it would simply not be a sound policy because it would destroy our own alliances. It would not, in fact, force, uh, get, get rid of the nuclear threat, even if you got all of the satellites released and uh, it would almost surely end in general war, and that is not a sound or wise policy. The rejection of Project Control by the politicians did not stop LeMay from continuing his own program of secret overflights. In April 1956 alone, he sent 27 spy planes over the Soviet Union. I simply remember no incident uh, where such flights were, were authorized. And I would be astounded that, uh, A, that it happened, and B, that I don't, uh, don't now remember it if it did happen. And I do think that I would have known because uh, that was my job. I was the defense liaison officer in Eisenhower's uh, office. President Eisenhower said that he was not going to have uh, the armed forces uh, flying over the Soviet Union, that that actually was uh, an act of war. I don't know whether that would be appropriate to say or not. Of course, the old man's dead now, uh, God rest his soul, but uh, this was back at a uh, debriefing at SAC headquarters. And, uh, and uh, he made a loose comment. He said, well, maybe if we do this uh, overflight right, we can get World War III started. And uh, I think that was just a, uh, just a loose comment uh, for his staff guys because uh, General Power was his uh, hatchet man in those days, and uh, he chuckled, and General Power never laughed very much, so I always figured that was kind of a, a joke between them somewhere or another. After asking me to turn off the tape recorder, he did tell some stories in a boastful manner of how SAC deliberately sent American bombers into Russian airspace in the 1950s. There was a hint in that interview with me, however, as he told those stories, a hint that he wouldn't have minded if uh, such overflights had provoked an escalating series of incidents between the United States and Russia that would allow that kind of preventive attack to take place. LeMay imagined that he faced an enemy spoiling for a fight. But the Soviet leader, Khrushchev, was not yet ready to take the bait, as his son remembers. My father's greatest fear was that West will know how weak we are. So he wanted the Soviet Union to be accepted as the great power. He was a realist, he understood that our GNP at that time was one-fifth of United States GNP, so it was impossible to compete. It was only one possibility to do this, it is to use the threat of the using nuclear weapons. Moscow skies are filled with the first public display of Russia's newest combat aircraft. Startling Western observers with their... So Khrushchev engaged in a game of bluff. He created the appearance of having more long-range nuclear bombers than he in fact possessed. The May's intelligence officers fell for the trick. ...and production ability may have been seriously underrated. Russia's major strides toward air supremacy forced urgent reappraisal of America's defense strategy. Uh, the issue at the time was the bomber gap. Supposedly, the Soviets had more bombers uh, than the United States, and not only had more bombers, but were going to produce more bombers. Keep in mind, what we did is we saw a bomber. We counted that bomber as being operational. When we knew that there is no bomber force in the world, that you can look down and say all bombers are operational. The president doubted Air Force planes. But in 1956, intelligence chiefs persuaded him to authorize a series of spy overflights. Eisenhower insisted the CIA, not the Air Force, be in charge. His experience had been that the armed forces, having received an approval to do something, would extend it 
or do something somewhat different. He felt that the CIA could conduct this without it being a, uh, uh, a provocative uh, act which uh, really uh, uh, would come in the co uh, category of war rather than the kind of thing that intelligence agencies did during so-called peacetime. The first mission of the U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union was on the 4th of July, 1956. That same day, Khrushchev made a friendly gesture towards his enemies. It was the flight of the U-2, and the flight of the U-2 not on the ordinary day, but on the July 4th. And the, not only on the ordinary July 4th, but it was the second time in the post-war history where Soviet leadership decided to visit American embassy. So for him, it was the blow and the demonstration from the American government that we, we can and we will do what we want. That particular mission, we flew over the long-range bomber bases in the Ukraine and Leningrad. We flew deeper into the Soviet Union, over Moscow, and covered more bomber bases. The missions that we flew uh, that essentially went up to the Urals proved fairly conclusively that there was no bomber gap. Two months after the National Photographic Interpretation Center came in the bean, we had solved one major problem, and that was the bomber gap didn't exist. Despite photographic evidence that showed LeMay had greatly overestimated the Soviet bomber threat, in June 1957, with the help of powerful friends in Congress, he was promoted to Vice Chief of the Air Force. He handed the command of SAC to his old friend and colleague, Thomas Power. If further expansion of SAC was no longer justified by the bomber gap, Khrushchev's latest gambit provided a brand new threat. <laughs> Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. The Soviets, of course, uh, launched Sputnik. And there was criticism of everybody. There was criticism of the academic community. There was criticism of the U.S. missile program. Keep in mind that most of our missiles were, were blowing up on the pads. So the so-called missile gap began to uh, develop, that we were way behind the Soviets. Well, when we flew the satellites in 60, that proved conclusively that not only was there was no bomber gap, no missile gap, and no megatonnage gap. And that's when Eisenhower, in one of his last, uh, last uh, ventures as a president, uh, denounced the danger of an unbridled uh, military-industrial complex. A hotly contested election campaign closes with Senator John F. Kennedy the choice... The election of 1960 was fought around the bomber and missile gap. Kennedy successfully argued that Eisenhower had failed to prevent the Russians gaining superiority over the Americans. But once in office, the Kennedy administration became suspicious of what the military were up to. A senior Pentagon official, Daniel Ellsberg, was the first civilian to see the war plan. What he found shocked him. The reason it had the name Joint Strategic Capabilities Plan, which is rather obscure and, and innocent sounding, kind of plan, sounds rather logistical, like a capabilities plan of some sort, uh, it, it was that they wanted to prevent civilian authority from being fully aware that there was a single piece of paper that expressed the Joint Chiefs of Plan staff operational plan for all-out nuclear war. There was a JCS Joint Chief of Staff document which directed everyone never to use in correspondence or discussion with civilian officials of the Office of Secretary of Defense for the White House the name Joint Strategic Capabilities Plan or the initials JSCP by which it was known. What Ellsberg found confirmed the administration's worst fears. SAC was an Air Force with only one response to any problem, total nuclear annihilation of the enemy. In Washington, 
Kennedy gathered a team of experts to provide a more flexible and graduated strategy. General Thomas Power heard about this crazy briefing that was going on in Washington mostly and demanded of General White that I be shipped out <laughs> to Omaha <laughs> to uh, talk, talk with him and his staff. And he uh, had me come to his uh, briefing room and had assembled all his key generals. He said, you know, you academic lily-livered <laughs> uh, types from the Rand Corporation, all you want to do is uh, save lives. I'm going <laughs> to dispose of them. He said that he would regard it as victory if there were two Americans and only one Russian left. He really didn't seem to be fully in control of himself. It was as though I was witnessing some strange performance in which this four-star general was displaying several different personalities, as it were. And it did lead me to wonder, is this, uh, is this the individual who really commands this enormous uh, center of power? The mission of the Strategic Air Command is to be prepared to conduct strategic air operations on a global basis. Now, the important thing is that we have the capability to carry out that mission. And what's more important is the fact that Mr. Khrushchev is well aware of that capability. Now, whether you or anyone else agrees with that statement really doesn't matter. The important thing is the record's clean. I don't know that it would be fair for me to challenge his integrity, but I frequently concern myself with it. Uh, he was... Uh, Towards the end, he got so bad that he would not talk to anybody unless he had somebody in the room recording everything that was said. I'd be behind the chair and there with all these mouth things and recording what happened. And why? I don't know. You know, that's some kind of a paranoia or something. I, I felt that he was losing his stability uh, as he uh, aged and with all the, all the weight and responsibilities that he had on his shoulders. Um, and you say that, that this just wasn't your concern, this was a view shared by a number of people. I, I think that if you interviewed uh, the, the major staff members of his command, you would find that the majority of them would feel the same way, would express their same, same opinion as I've expressed. Despite the reports coming in on his top generals, Kennedy maintained cordial relations in public both with SAC High Command and General LeMay. The May, however, had begun to think the unthinkable and question who should have authority to launch a nuclear strike. I'd really never heard it questioned by anyone that it was appropriate for the president to make that life and death decision, life and death not just for Americans but for most of the world. And uh, May did question it. He added to, he, he brought out himself, <clears throat> that after all, should the president even be in the loop? for that decision, which is Pentagon language, meaning uh, should he be part of the decision process, even if he were alive? And he was smoking a cigar, I remember, in a way that looked very tough, always, and he growled, and he said, after all, who's better able to make that decision? A man who's been preparing all of his adult life to make that decision face that question, or some politician who may have only been in office a few months. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, Unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. 
here you have 100-foot tents, 65-foot missiles in ranch country and a bunch of military tents. You know, this is not a Boy Scout jamboree out there. You know, this is something serious. And not only that, but, you know, what were you going to do with 100-foot tents? And then 65-foot trailers, you know, those are not associated with, uh, uh, with agriculture. The United States' answer to Soviet blackmail in Cuba was a quarantine of all offensive weapons being... The cause of the Cuban Missiles Crisis was the misperception and misunderstanding of my father because he did not realize the reaction of the American people. He thought in the European behavior. When you all the time had the enemies on your borders, Americans was different. All their life, they have no real enemies close to their borders. And when they realize that they have the missiles, which can hit them from Cuba, they became crazy and they was ready to die, but to push this out of the country. This time it looked as though Khrushchev had bluffed once too often and LeMay would be able to go to war. LeMay always referred to Russia as the bear. In his briefing he'd always talk about the bear. And uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis he said, uh, well the bear has stuck his foot in the, uh, in the Latin American waters and we got him in a trap. He said, let's take his leg off right up to his testicles. And then he said, better still, let's take off his testicles, too. SAC quadrupled the number of planes flying around the Soviet Union. A third of its nuclear bomber force, 500 planes, went to 15-minute alert. 7,000 megatons of nuclear weapons were readied, enough for 500,000 Hiroshima's. Самый близкий подход к ядерной войне это был в пятницу 26 октября 1962 года. В том числе летали Ю-2. И вот 27 26 в пятницу был сбит вот самолет Ю-2 над Кубой, который пилотировал Рудольф Андерсон. И это сразу дало козыри военным, что вот что они делают. И вот и кроме того, шел все время обмен между Хрущевым и Кеннеди, вот попытки урегулировать. И тут Кеннеди пошло тоже очередное сообщение по радио, и прервалась связь на какое-то время. With both sides close to war, SAC increased the tension. It launched a test missile, it didn't have a warhead, from California. A provocation that's unimaginable, a missile toward the Soviet Union. It wired around the missiles that were just then being installed, the first generation of Minutemen missiles in, in the United States, wired around them so that it had independent launch control. Uh, General Power broadcast uh, a message to the troops in the clear. This is General Power speaking. We're in an advanced state of readiness and feel we're well prepared. I expect you to put yourself in a maximum readiness condition. If you're not sure what to do in any situation, and if time permits, get in touch with us here. The message that General Power made personally, I thought it was an essential message. And in the clear, uh, it was, there was no other way he could make it that real. Additionally, I'm sure that if the Russians heard it, they believed it, and that was what they should have done. Power had given перевести авиацию во вторую готовность, то есть еще более высокую. Причем сказал, чтобы это дали открытым текстом по радио, так? то есть чтобы мы об этом не знали. Кроме того, мы видели и наблюдали, что увеличивается количество дежур... самолетов, бомбардировщиков в воздухе, которые э, уже по получении сигнала через 8 часов могли подойти к нашим границам. Так обычно это летало 15-20 самолетов, а в эти дни количество этих самолетов даже достигало 80-100 самолетов, то есть 100 бомбардировщиков с ядерными бомбами постоянно находились в воздухе и ждали только сигнала. Конечно, все это вызывало большую тревогу, но мы все-таки, конечно, надеялись, что политики как-то договорятся, чтобы разрядить эту обстановку. Мы были 35 миль от Марокканской аэробейса в Мекнес. During the height of the missile crisis, a MiG-15 buzzed my field. I thought the gong would have sounded. Now, it 
was a curious pilot. But I thought of two things. One, I've got to get the message to SAC. I've got to get the crews airborne, the aircraft airborne. And my God, what's going to happen to my family? <laughs> They retreat to Moscow. Russian ships steam out from Cuban ports. At the last moment, the politicians prevented an attack. The world had looked over the edge and discovered it had no stomach for nuclear war. The long reign of LeMay and power was coming to an end. Power retired in 1964, LeMay a few months later. of fighting the Cold War with threat of nuclear Armageddon lived on. General LeMay was the most prominent figure in the culture of destruction, a mentality that had exempted itself from concern for human life, concern for people, exempted itself from any distinction between civilians and soldiers. And uh, as I uh, John F. Kennedy once said to me uh, at the time of the missile crisis uh, and some proposals of that sort came up for taking Russia, Soviet Union out of existence. He said, do these people belong to the human race? LeMay had spent his professional life trying to limit civilian control of the military. When he put aside his uniform, he tried to win that control for himself. He ran on the presidential ticket with extreme right-winger George Wallace. For the first time, LeMay could publicly express his views, putting Wallace on the defensive. General LeMay hasn't advocated the use of nuclear weapons, not at all. He discussed nuclear weapons with you. He's against the use of nuclear weapons, and I am too. If I found it necessary, I would use anything that we could dream up. Anything that we could dream up, including nuclear weapons, if it was necessary. 